Starting with the tank's running gear, just like I mentioned in the unboxing portion of the video, I went ahead and swapped out the stock plastic track and plastic sprocket with the metal versions from Matto. The Matto drop-in replacements are extremely easy to install and once added greatly help the model. Not only as an accuracy like I mentioned before with that of the rubber pads or the lack thereof on the plastic versions, but also with the tank's performance. The metal tracks really help settle the tank down, give it a little bit extra added weight which will help it overcome certain obstacles when it comes time to running. Also the metal components do slow the tank's speed down a little bit which also helps to give it a little bit more of a realistic appearance compared to its stock plastic plastic offering. Now, in addition to the track, of course, the sprocket will also have to be swapped out as well, as having a metal track with a plastic sprocket is exa not exactly a recipe for long endurance running. As for the track's finish, because this is the metal chevron version of the track, this actually helps to look at the tank the more the tank is driven. This, unlike the versions which represent that of the rubber chevron, in which if you're driving the tank and the paint starts wearing off on the track pads, which on the real tank would be made out of rubber, if, they're, if you see metal poking through, this actually hurts the continuity of the model. So for radio control use, the metal chevrons are greatly more recommended in my opinion. Now, as for the actual finish themselves, the exterior portion of the track is actually left totally stock. Not a single drop of paint or any type of other finishing was needed to have been made. These tracks do come with a black oxide finish from the factory, which is very true to the form of the real vehicle. So go ahead and painting them wasn't really necessary. However, on the real Pershing track, the inner pads are actually made of rubber. On the model here, I painted the inner portion of the track, unfortunately it's a little bit difficult to get into frame with the lighting, with a different shade of black compared to the black oxide. This was also weathered with the same type of weathering that you see that on the rubber tires, thus giving the illusion that the track's inner portion are rubber. Moving our way to the tank sprockets, like I said before, the sprockets you see on this model are the metal ones from Matto. Now the sprockets are very nicely done and installed without any hitches, however one area to improve upon is that of the center hub detailing. The stock metal versions as well as the stock hand long versions do not have any sort of detailing present, in fact it's just that of a allen fastener which is the main fastener which is used to bolt the sprockets to the spindle. Now there is a detail drop in set and is found on Shapeways and the piece is 3D printed. Here I have a set here and they are supplied by the following link that you can see below. The set contains two of these hub, faux hub detailings which are hollow which allow room for the fastener to stay concealed inside. Now these pieces are 3D printed and are recommended and installed very easy and effortlessly. However, one mod that I went ahead and made is, as you can see on the stock 3D printed piece, on the center fastener there's a hole that is printed directly through. On the set on the model here, I went ahead and deleted the center fastener, which is printed on, and replaced it with that of a real metal fastener. This in, improves the look of the piece and gives a little bit more accuracy compared to having it with that hole present. Now, the fasteners which are used to mount the sprockets to the spindle are loctited in place, so they don't unravel or loosen up over time. As for the hub detailing, this is glued on with actually white glue, so it gives a nice tight mounting however it's temporary in that if I ever have to get access to the center fastener I could simply just pop this piece off. Now like I mentioned in the unboxing portion the gearboxes were swapped out with the high performance gearboxes from Hanlong, the red ones. Now one side effect that the red gearboxes have is that of their motors. The red gearboxes have these blue motors on them which output a lot more speed on them compared to the stock motors which were originally found on the gearbox. Now these blue motors they're great in that they do output a lot of power and a lot of speed however they do give a speed that is a little bit too fast for a scale representation of something like a Sherman or in this case an M26 Pershing. The customer requested to have the high performance 
extra speed motors swapped out with that of the original motors which were found on the stock gearbox. Since everything is in spec with each other, the swap out was not very hard to do. You simply just take out the two fasteners which mount on the gears boxes to the motor and simply swap them out. By doing this, you have the advantage of having an all metal gearbox with the ball bearings and the steel gears. However, you also have the more slower speed of the stock motor, which does help the performance of the tank and gives it a more scale speed to its running. Moving our way to the tank's actual running road wheels, the road wheels that you see on this tank are based off of the Tamiya units, however, Henlong did simplify them compared to the Tamiya offering. Rather than having a two-piece pattern wheel where you have a plastic center hub with a molded rubber tire, which is found on the Tamiya, on the Henlong, it's a lot different. You just have a single casting road wheel, which is molded in a black plastic. This is true for just about all of the vehicles that are produced by Henlong. The wheels also secure onto the axles on the swing arms in a slightly different way compared to that of the Tamiya. The Tamiya is more higher performance with that of bushings or what can also be replaced with ball bearings. On these guys here, it's just basically plastic on plastic. Now, you would think that this would add extra wear to the swing arm into the wheels. However, with the material that they're molded in, they do have a very good life to them and do perform very well as the plastics are actually pretty slick and do have a little bit of lubrication properties to them. However, one mod that I made to the row wheels, and this is one I've done to many Henlong tanks, is during the construction, I go ahead and remove all of these road wheels. The road wheels are held on with a single Allen fastener, which is found concealed underneath the hubcaps. When you remove the fastener, the entire wheel slides off the axle. This gives good opportunities to not only thoroughly paint all of the components, but for the swing arm axles themselves, they are coated with a smear of grease just prior to the reinstallation of the row wheels. In addition to that, a drop of red Loctite are used on each and every one of the fasteners which holds the wheels onto the hull. This extra bit of lubrication also helps with the performance of the model as well as also with the red Loctite prevents the wheels from ever getting loose. Now it's also important to point, to point out that when I'm painting and priming the lower hull, all of the surfaces which make contact with the wheel axles are all masked up to prevent any sort of paint from getting onto these pieces as obviously you want to have these components as slick as possible and paint is a bad idea to get on these surfaces. So the masking is required. Now it's also important to point out that there are aftermarket replacements for not only the row wheels as well as the swing arms that are found on the aftermarket scene. However, on this build here, it was not necessary. One final thing to discuss on the suspension is actually one of the dings that are found on these Henlong models. Now, not only is this true for the Henlong, but it's also true for the Tegan tanks as well. And that is the way the suspension functions. Now, the tank does have a fully articulating suspension and it works very well. And it also holds up the weight of the tank very well too. Unfortunately, one of the dings that this has is that with the detail and with the way the suspension functions. If you look at the suspension, every single road wheel has an external shock absorber with an external coil spring that is used to actually give you the springiness and the return of the suspension. The issue is that on the real M26 Pershing, only the first two and last two of the bogey wheels have this extra shock absorber present. The road wheels in the center do not have or need these external shocks and everything is done internally. Now this is correctly represented on the Tamiya 116 scale full option kits. However, one of the shortcuts that Henlong took when they were first copying and redesigning the Tamiya tooling was to simplify the suspension by giving every row wheel an external shock, which as a business standpoint makes sense as it does simplify the model thus reducing the cost. Now regrettably this is one of the features that stayed with this tank with not only again the, the Hemlong but the Tegan versions as well and regrettably at the time of this video there is no real solution to solve this problem. 
Now, these external shocks are something that the builder and the owner of the models just or it's one of those things they're just gonna have to learn to live with. Now, personally for me, it's not that big of a deal. And if you leave the vehicle with its side skirts present, it mostly covers up the inaccuracy of the shock absorbers. That also, the shock absorbers really just blend into the suspension when everything is said and done. But if there is anyone out there who's interested in accurizing one of these tanks fully, and the external shocks are an issue to them, you're really, best bet or only recourse is to just save up the extra money and go for the Tamiya full option kit. Moving from the suspension takes us to what would have originally been that of the side skirts. As you can see the side skirts on this model have been amputated and removed. The side skirts are molded directly into the top plastic casting from the Henlong model and do require a little bit of trimming in order to fully remove. The side skirts were removed for two reasons. First, it was one of the requirements by the customer. And the second was that from the pictures of the actual tank Margaret that I have on hand, not only was the vehicle missing its original tin work of the side skirts, but it was also missing that of the front mud flaps as well. For removal of the components, I actually have the original mud flaps and the side skirts right here. They were removed from the tank with that of a Multimaster. Now, when you remove the side skirts, not only do you have to remove them from the side, but you also have to remove them from the top as well. And what I mean by that is that when the side skirts are originally molded in, they actually stick out of the tank side. Now this is as per the real vehicle if the side skirts are present. When you remove the side skirts you just can't just remove the section just below the fasteners and call it a day as you'll still have the width of the fenders with that of the side skirts still present. So with the with the Multimaster you simply just go right through the plastic on the fenders and it'll just cut right through. As for the front mud flaps on the M26 Pershing family, the mud flaps are angular like you see here. If you also notice, I went ahead and drilled out the small little holes which are present on the side of the tin work and on the real vehicle this is actually where the fenders would bolt to the tin work. So with the side skirts removed, the holes need to be present. This is true for not only the sides, but also from the top portion as well. Now, in addition to removing the from mud flaps, you'll also have to do another trick, which is that of thinning out the plastic of the fender. The plastic that's molded for the top casting is a fairly substantial thickness, and which is actually really good in that it's nice and sturdy and strong on the tank, you're not going to have to worry about the piece cracking on you. When it comes to removal of the fenders, it's going to be very thick in representation of that of the actual tin work of the fender. To solve this with a file, I just go ahead and file down this section, which gives you the illusion of the thinner edge. This is also done to the side portion as well. This is a trick that is commonly done by many model builders, but it's definitely one that does have its merit. Now, in addition to sanding it down from here, you don't go all the way up to the edge. And the reason for that is that on the real tin work, the piece is has a bend to it for that of the fastener locations for that of the side skirts. So that when you're sanding this down with a file, you just leave this tiny little corner here with the original thickness, and this gives you the illusion that you have the bent piece throughout the entire length of the side skirt. Another bit of detailing that was added that was missing with the kit was that of the mud flap and the fender support straps. The M26 Pershing family has its tin work mounted to the front of the hull and secured with that of fasteners and that those fasteners are connected to a strip which is welded directly to the front armor plate. Now this detailing is not only missing on the Henlong units, but it's also missing on the Tamiya kits as well. To fabricate this missing detailing, this is done with a strip of plastic that has not only its fastener location holes present, but also its weld beads added. It's a mirror image on the opposite side. Now one thing that's important to point out is that the strip is not flush with that of the side of the tank. There is going to be a small little gap and it's inset so that when the fenders would be mounted, 
they have an offset and are not just flush with this cavity section here of the running gear. Another mod that needs to be made to the tin work, specifically if you delete the side skirts, is that of the under sections of where the storage boxes are. This is true for the headlong, however, possibly the Tegan as well. On these versions of the kit, Henlong went ahead and took another shortcut in that they went ahead and integrally molded on the storage boxes directly to the fenders. Tamiya has these components separate and by doing that the Tamiya fenders are solid through and through and the boxes just simply mount on in a hollow manner. Because of the Henlong shortcut you do have cavities underneath these three sections over here as well as on the opposite side for that of ease of molding. The issue comes is when you delete the side skirts like I've done on this build here. In certain angles you will see and peek into the large cavities which are found under the tin work. On this model here I went ahead and fabricated and replaced those missing sections with that of plastic sheets. With the plastic sheets added the fender work is a lot more solid and is more realistic than leaving it with the cavities exposed. While on the boxes, this was another section that really was improved a lot from the stock original offering. Like I said before, Henlong did take a shortcut with integrally molding these pieces to the top fender. Another place where they took the shortcut was the actual detailing found on them. If you look, I went ahead and fabricated the lid sections that are absent on the stock Henlong kit. As well as with the Tegan, these pieces here are totally flush and on the real Pershing, there, you would have this little lip as this is where the lid interacts with that of the bottom portion of the box. These lid detailings here are all fabricated out of strips of styrene and once added really helped the look of the model compared to leaving it stock. Another bit of detailing that was added was that of the little footman loops which are found on the sides of these boxes. These were all fabricated out of thin pieces of wire that were bent and mounted to the model. Now these pieces here are in the locations which, where they would be found on the real Pershing. And they are not a mirror image on the opposite side. On the right hand side of the tank you will see these little footmen loose basically around the entire side of the, of the fender work. And on the rear portion they are in this portion over here. Now this is one bit of detailing that is also not present with the Tamiya kit and if added will also help kick the model up a few more notches. Moving our way to the storage bin lids, the lids have small little locking handles that are found on them. Now these pieces here are not the stock originals. The stock original handlong units are integrally molded into the bins. This is actually very reminiscent to the Tamiya kit, which actually has this system done as well. However, on the Tamiya kit, there's a separate runner of better detail handles that require you to delete the molded in ones in order to put on the better detailed counterparts. This is also true for the opposite side, and this is actually also true for the Taken tanks as well. Now, rather than leaving the basic handles in place, I emulated the Tamiya setup so that I can replace the units with these resin ones that I have installed on this tank here, as well as the other Henlong Pershing builds that I have lined up in the future. Moving from the lids takes us to the first aid kit. The first aid kit on the M26 series is found in this location here. Now what's interesting about the kit is that the kit gives you provisions for mounting the first aid kit not only in this location but also on this side as well. This is inaccurate and is something that needs to be addressed by the builder. The To accurize the, the tank I went ahead and deleted the molded in sections for the mountings of the first aid kit and the mounting holes were plugged up and sanded flush with that of bodywork. As for the first aid kit itself, the first aid kit is the kit original one, however was modified very slightly in order to get it to the way you see here. Basically all that was done was that the seams were polished away and deleted and the section for the lid was made flush as the kit one is indented. In addition to the first aid kit there are also several holes that are molded into the sections here of the lids in order for mounting that of 
crew accessories. These accessories were not used on this build, so I went ahead and had to delete and plug up all of these holes. The holes were deleted and then flared in with the bodywork. This does require a little bit of technique to do, however, once done, these were a nice seamless appearance that you see on this model. Moving our way to the rear portion of the tin work takes us to the strengthening strips. Shortly after the T26 E3 Pershings were actually fielded in combat, one design issue that was quickly realized was that of the tin work in the front near the mud flaps and on the back here near the sprockets. Due to the width of the tin work, it was quickly discovered in field that these sections here had a tendency of bending and breaking. What was quickly developed were that of the strengthening strips. The way the strengthening strips work is that they basically just give tension and support to the section here of the tin work and prevents it from bending and breaking when in use. As for the actual design of the component, on this vehicle here is that of a simple rod with a yoke and mount setup. The rod connects to a section here on the tin work and on a mount on the rear of the hull. These strengthening ribs would be present on M26 Pershings which were improved from the T26 E3 prototypes. Now for the model here, these components are fabricated out of metal strip and metal wire and are all soldered together. This is to ensure the max amount of strength as this model here is radio controlled and it does need to be sturdy enough for the rigors of RC use. Now these pieces here are found on both sides of the model and are really a mirror image in their construction. However, on the opposite side, due to the shape of the telephone box, there's a small little bend and kink found in the rod and this is as per the real vehicles. Now it's also important to point out that there were two designs for these rigidity strips that were found. The first pattern is like the one you see here and it's comprised of a single smooth rod that was threaded on either end for the mounting of the yoke. The second design actually used that of a turnbuckle system and was a little bit more elaborate. That system is found on more M26 A1 Pershings which shortly came after the production of the standard M26 like this vehicle is here. Now what's interesting is I actually made a version of the M26 A1 in 116 scale a number of years ago and a model showcase video of that model is found on the ECA YouTube channel. I definitely recommend for anyone who's interested in that vehicle to check it out as a lot of the features found on this tank here were further improved on the A1 variant. Now as for this version here only the rear sections on this model have the rigidity and strengthening ribs. This is as per the real vehicle that I was modeling. As the photographs that I've seen of the tank, the tank is missing the two strengthening strips which are found on the front. More than likely the tank originally had them, however they were removed as soon as the front mud flaps were pitched. Moving our way to the rear plate of the model, this is one portion of the build that did require a lot of mods compared to the stock original offering. First, one of the quickest things that you can see is that I went ahead and added weld beads in these two locations over here. On the real M26 family of Pershing, the entire lower hull was comprised of a mosaic of both rolled steel and cast components that were all welded together to give you the shape of the lower hull. On the back portion, you would see these welds in these two locations. Another mod that had to have been made was that of the removal of two of the fastener location holes that are located in these two sections here. The way the Henlong model is assembled is that there are several Phillips fasteners which go ahead and bolt and secure the top and lower hulls together. This, these two sections here are unsightly and to improve the look of the model I went ahead and deleted them. Now because these fasteners actually serve a function I need to have something in lieu of the fastener to help keep the rear portion of the deck to the tank. So rather instead of having the fasteners, I use that of two powerful magnets. The magnets are located where the fasteners would go on the inside and do a suffice job in keeping the top deck firmly in place. The fastener location holes were then promptly deleted and blended into the rest of the bodywork. 
thus helping and really giving the tank a better look. This is also true for the fastener for that of the smoke system. In this section here, there is an integrally molded hole for that of the fastener to hold the smoke system in place. Just like with the fasteners for the top deck, this was plugged up and deleted with the bodywork as well. While on the lower pan here, you can see a small little axis cap. These axis caps are found on the real M26 family, and this set here is absent on the Henlong model. This is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line and has been listed on the catalog. It's a simple bit of detailing that gives the tank a little bit of forgotten detail, but is one that also does help the look of the build overall. Another improvement that was made and found on the M26 as opposed to the T26 E3 was that of the final drive reinforcement braces. Just like with the fenders, another problem that was found with the T26 E3 when fielded was that the final drives were weak in the way they attached to the lower hull. To give them more strength and support, these braces were designed. The way the braces work is that they give the final drive another attachment point to the lower hull, thus making them stronger and more robust. These components here are found on the production M26 Pershings as well as the M26A1. The components that you see on this model here are made from resin and are also posted on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. Moving from the axis cap takes us to the tow hitch mount as well as the tow cable hookups. These locations here are all stock and were simply used out of box. Some well details were added to the components which were missing from the kit original offering. Moving up from the tow eyes takes us to the tow hitch which is the kit original and was used out of box. One portion of the plate that was modified though was that of where the tow cable would be found in this location here. One of the requirements that the customer had was that he didn't want to have the tow cable detailing in this area. The number one reason for that is that this area here is very susceptible to breaking and these tow cables which are plastic on the stock original handlong kit as well as the Tamiya kit are in a very frail location and have a habit of snapping at the tow eye which is located in this section here. If anyone has the Tamiya unit or any of the long ones you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Now rather than having it replaced with a metal cable, the customer simply did not want any cable detailing at all so the cable was omitted. In the cable's place however I do have the little tow cable clips and mounts which would be found and is where the cable would actually spool on. These pieces of detail here are all fabricated out of strips of metal that are soldered to a pin in order for that of mounting to the rear hull. We also have here a ECA tow cable mounting cleat which is found on the product line and has been used on several 116 builds in the past. Moving up from the tow cable equipment takes us to the tank's travel lock. Now this is another signature component that differentiates this tank from being an M26 as opposed to the T26 E3 Pershings. The T26 E3 Pershing has a very distinctive travel lock in which the travel lock is directly mounted to the tank's exhaust casting and swivels out of the way when not in use. One of the problems that was found with the T26 E3 design was that after prolonged use, due to the heat that the manifold was subject to, the travel lock mounts would actually crack and break, which would have been found in these locations here. The design of the travel lock and exhaust manifold was modified and changed to the layout that you see here. The travel lock still pivots out of the way and tucks in underneath the exhaust which is a very nice feature. However, rather than it being directly connected to the exhaust manifold, it is mounted on two smaller hinges which are adjacent to the manifold, thus allowing it to straddle the manifold and not make contact with the casting itself. This setup here is a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line. It consists of the hinges, the casting for the travel lock, the top hinge section, as well as the small little hinge plates.
What is not included with the set is that of the exhaust manifold casting itself. As on the M26 version, these castings here were not changed. The only difference between the T26E3 manifold and the M26 manifold is that the T26E3 manifold has these two lugs in this location here that are drilled and tapped for that of the mounting fastener. On the M26 with this pattern of travel lock design, the lugs were left in the integral casting. However, we're just left as is and we're not drilled and machined further. When you're working on one of these kits, you simply retain the stock, either Tamiya, Tegan, or in this case, Henlong exhaust manifold. You just simply plug up the mounting locations for that of the travel lock with some putty and you're ready to go. Now, it's also important to point out that this design was changed further on the M26A1 in which the travel lock was moved from this location to the top deck. The M26A1 version is also found on the ECA product line. However, that version also features a replacement exhaust manifold as the exhaust manifold was changed from the M26 and T26 E3 variants. More information about that is discussed in the A1 video, which again is listed on the YouTube channel. Moving our way to the communication telephone box, this setup you see here is stock with the hen long. The one modification that I made that is a very simple mod that anyone can do is that of the electrical conduit. It's a simple wire that's drilled into the bottom portion here of the box and its corresponding hole was drilled into the hull. A small wire was added and this helps the look of the model. Now on the Tamiya versions, this comes out of box. Moving on from the telephone box takes us to the actual rear taillights themselves. Now the rear taillights that you see on this model here were modified from the stock original. The stock Henlong units utilize standard domed LEDs for that of the taillight detailing. The lights do work very well, however are missing the cat eye which is found on these USAFV pieces. For the cat eye lens detailing, these were acquired from shapeways.com and are also 3D printed. They can be found via the following link. Now these pieces here, if we notice, are the post World War II version with that of the little star fasteners which are found around the rim. To backdate them for World War II, you simply delete these little nubs, giving you the shape of the World War II pattern cat's eye. Now to mount them to the Henlong hull, you do have to make some small mods basically to the LED. The dome section found on the LED was flattened off with a Dremel and this gives you the location to mount on the 3D printed version. The 3D printed one was basically just cut so that you have the top section here and it just plugs onto the LED. This does greatly help improve the accuracy of the piece and since the piece is an LED you can't flatten the face of it and the component will still be able to function. This is something that is just not available with an older light bulb. While on the taillights you'll notice that they are left and right hand specific and it's important not to make that mistake when building any one of these American tanks.